Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast for covering uh, June 19th through June 25th. It's episode number 46. This is the third time I'm trying to record this. It's Monday morning, the 26th, and uh, with the new travel ban update, every time I try to record, I get new phone calls from people who are just freaking out, which I understand, but uh, I think I have to not pick up my phone to get this recording out. It's going a little late because of the conference, the ALA conference that was happening, uh, and it was a lot of fun, but it's very busy. It was hard for me to get things done sooner. But uh, we're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna catch up with some of the news first and then go on some fun stuff I learned at the conference. I can't fit it all into this one podcast, so it's gonna be a continuous thing. Just talking about the different things, the relationships, news, events, uh, facts, and cases. Everything I picked up at the conference to share with you. And I wanna thank everyone who stopped me and said hi and I talked with. It was a true pleasure meeting all of you and hopefully I can see you at the next conference, I believe. It's gonna be in San Francisco. If not sooner, I travel a lot. Hopefully we could have some drinks or something whenever I'm in your city. Thanks so much, and without any more, let's get it started. Welcome to the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. I am the host, Attorney John Kasravi, and I practice U.S. immigration law exclusively. For more information about the program, please visit www.immigrationlawyerspodcast.com. Please note that this recording is informational only and does not constitute legal advice. Please consult with a licensed attorney for specific legal guidance that suits your case. Also, this recording is copyrighted and written permission is required for rebroadcasting. For more information about me, please visit www.jqklaw.com. So let's just jump in with the news while it's happening. Of course, the travel ban is the hot news right now. It's uh, been reopened by the Supreme Court. Uh, they opened it up a little allowing some of President Trump's ideas to go in. In particular, they said the travel ban uh, will affect uh, people, citizens of those six nations, uh, if they don't have any ties to the U.S. Now, unfortunately, the language is broad. They say, you know, bona fide relationships, family-wise, how far does that go? Is a cousin count or is that to be a mother, father, brother, and sister? Where is that line? Also, they say if there's an entity in the U.S., well, does that, that includes like universities for student visas, but that, does that include a company you made yourself or an E2 that's hiring you? How, do, how does that work in all of this? Uh, they specifically do say like a mother-in-law case is okay, a student visa case is okay, a lecturer coming to speak is okay. Um, also, it applies to uh, refugees. So refugees also have to have those ties or else they can't come in. The dissent makes some good points. It says, the court's remedy will prove unworkable. Today's compromise will burden executive off officials with the task of deciding on peril of contempt, whether individuals from the six affected nations who wish to enter the United States have a sufficient connection to a person or entity in this country. The compromise will invite a flood of litigation until this case is finally resolved on the merits as parties and courts struggle to determine what exactly constitutes a bona fide relationship. Who precisely has a credible claim to that relationship and whether the claim relationship was formed simply to avoid uh, Section 2C of the executive order of the ban. Uh, and the litigation of factual and legal issues that are likely to arise will presumably be directed to the two district courts whose initial orders in these cases this court has now, has now unanimously found sufficiently questionable to be stayed as the vast majority of the people potentially affected. Now the court's going to hear this again and start hearing it in the next session in October. So there's some leeway for some people entering. There's confusion in the time between. I'm getting the phone calls uh, and I'm not sure what to answer because there's a lot of times people that aren't my clients calling me. I just had a call I had to shut down the previous recording for for a guy that had a J1. You want to see if that applies. They said, listen, the F1, they said it's okay. I got to review your case. I can't just say, okay, you're good and then have problems. Um, that requires a full constellation talking, but at the end, I'm going to say probably it's okay because it's a J1 similar to an F1, and he's going to get frustrated that I wouldn't just give him the answer beforehand. So uh, this puts immigration lawyers in the practice in a, in a difficult bind because uh, it, the client relationship and the community, they're going to think we're, I'm just trying to take money from to give an answer. But when the rule is not clear um, and not specific enough, that becomes a problem. Now, again, J1 is similar to F1. Hopefully, if that's a specific kind of case that they have, they're coming to a university institution, for example, it might apply. Uh, but we'll see how that happens. The Supreme Court had two other decisions last week. One was uh, the idea that uh, getting bad immigration advice in the criminal court proceedings um, could be a reason to reopen the case um, so they, they could review the bad immigration advice that was to the detriment when they pled to something. So that should be interesting. Also, uh, thankfully, they said this trivial lies or misrepresentation on applications, it's okay as long as you know the, the consequences of that truth coming out wouldn't stop the application from going forward. Uh, the government had argued, it's very strict, they said on a naturalization application, 
almost like if uh, a period is in the wrong place, there's a little bit of an error, the whole thing should be denied or a person could be denaturalized. Thankfully, the justices uh, considered that and found that to be too tedious and onerous on people to do. So that's out of the way. Uh, some news that happened, uh, the SEC filed a lawsuit against the Navy 5 Regional Center in Chicago that had a lot of problems, a lot of lawsuits, a lot of money uh, just being held and not used, and uh, a whole sort of a mess of problems. I met the developer, he was an immigration attorney as well. Um, he had uh, TV shows on the Iranian satellite, so he got a lot of money, uh, investment money for EB-5 from Iranians and China as always. Uh, and right now he's in hot water. I'm not going to pass judgment on what exactly happened. It's kind of confusing. I haven't fully delved into the situation. But the SEC involved, so it's very scary. There's $80, 90 million dollar lawsuit to get that money back. Once the feds are involved in uh, the Security Exchange Commission, it's a very scary situation. Uh, now the N-400 form had uh, online had some incorrect information from USCIS on the mailing address from June 12th to June 23rd. Um, they said that they're going to work with these and, and fix them up, but there was a, fi a location filing error. So if you had a naturalization case you filed with that address during this time period, it should probably go through, but go take a look and follow up USCIS. You might be getting your receipt notice a little late. Uh, the USCIS has opened the pre and processing option for H-1B visas for the Conrad waiver program. This should be a very small number of cases, but at least they have to, they are able to do the pre and processing aspect to get those cases done sooner. Uh, the Indian archery team was denied their, their group uh, visa, probably a P visa to enter the United States. Uh, obviously for you know ties and stuff like that. This has happened a couple of times in the last 12 months. Uh, there was a Himalayan women's soccer team and different groups that were denied visa. So, Always, you know, you think a national sports team because of the nature of it will be easily get their visa and they come here. But just because the facts of it are okay doesn't mean the embassy still won't deny it because of uh, worries that the people are going to come and stay in the U.S. Now, last week I went to a CBP meeting in my local office in Los Angeles, and I forgot to talk about it uh, in, in the last podcast. And also, I, I haven't uploaded the video for the last one yet just because I was so busy, but I'm going to upload that video and this one pretty quick back to back. But uh, interesting, they said is. Uh, when you do an immigrant visa case, um, the person has to come to the U.S., you know, they go through CBP, then they get the green card in the mail. There is an e-list green card fee that you have to pay. I think it's like $220. Definitely pay that before the person actually enters the United States or appears at the border. It's much faster to pay beforehand than they go to the border. Whereas if they go to the border, enter the United States, then you pay it, there's going to be long delays until you actually get the green card in those kind of cases because you have to redo the system, find everything out. So that's like mandatory. If you have a client that's got the immigrant visa, has entered the U.S., pay the immigrant visa fee as soon as possible. Don't let them enter the United States without having paid that in the airline system. Also, if you have complaints for DHS, contact DHS, DHS trips. For complaints, there's also a local, uh, you know, at the at the airport passenger service manager you can contact when there's different issues, and hopefully they could. That's a way of bypassing the AC trip by contacting the passenger services manager. Uh, that's a CBP officer within the airport or the regular port, and they could uh, help you fix the situation. Hopefully, that's regard to C, uh, CBP. Uh, one case I had that was very troublesome. I had a naturalization case. Uh, it was one of those IOE cases. It took seven or eight months to actually get the interview. Interview happened. Computer system was down during the interview. Interview it took another month or two to get it approved. Once it was approved, we got a notification online that said, you know, your your uh, oath ceremony notice hasn't mailed. Uh, if you don't get it within 30 days, contact us. We waited two and a half weeks. Finally got the letter. When we got the letter, the oath ceremony had been set for three days previous, so it was already late. And on the letter, it had been stamped that the letter was posted a day after the actual oath ceremony day. So these kind of problems happen. Client is very frustrated. Um, I understand the frustration, but you know USCIS will redo it and we'll go fix it and everything like that. But these kind of problems happen. So with regards to naturalization, if you don't get the notice, uh, if you get that email update, if, you're, if your case number is online and you get those notices, uh, and you get a notice that's coming, you don't get it within seven to 10 days, call them up, maybe go to the field office if you have the time and you have the ability to do so, or have your client go to get a paper copy or asking what it is. Because it uh, never in the past has an oath ceremony taken more than a week for me to get once the case has been approved at the interview. Uh, so that should have been a, 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 a red uh, sign, of, you know, a flashing sign that says there's something going on that they're having air to follow up with that. It just never happened at a situation like that. I didn't believe it would be possible that they make an oath ceremony letter and then mail it after the oath ceremony. They, it, that, that's just ridiculous in my opinion. Also, a big thing that's been happening is uh, USCIS has been sending biometrics notice appoint, appointment notices uh, to everyone but the actual applicant. So I've received uh, these biometrics appointments 
letters for people that aren't even my clients. So uh, I called USCIS and said this is happening a lot. If you follow the list, there are a lot of people are posting the information saying, you might have got your client's biometric appointment notice. This is happening. I actually have a case in Las Vegas, it's been two months, they haven't got their biometrics appointment notice. Uh, and USCIS said they haven't issued yet, it might be an error. So biometrics is having some problems. So that does it for all the news and events updates for now. Uh, sorry I'm rushing it, it just is a slammed Monday. <laughs> it's been a slammed weekend, so uh, there's uh, this recording, I kinda have to get it done. One interesting note I wanted to talk about, and I have to study this a lot more, but the European Union is, is passing some data security laws uh, with regards to cases, uh, regards to emails. So if you have an email and you're sending attachment, and they're having problems with uh, you know security breaches, so they don't want people to include you know sensitive data, professionals like us, to include sensitive data in these emails. So what does that mean? From what I gather, and I'm gonna talk about this more in the future is, I know I can't just email an I-134 and it's complete to my client to review. It's better and appropriate that I you know upload that into a secure server, something like Dropbox, and have the client access that Dropbox file instead of sending it directly by email. Uh, that's going to go into place next year and you could potentially uh, be affected by that if you're an immigration attorney deal with European clients, EU clients. So that's something to be something important to be prepared for. Um, the interesting thing is one of the attorneys I spoke about is the EU wants to make it so that if a client asks you to destroy all their files, you have to destroy them. But on the other end, uh, as you know, US attorneys, we have requirements to hold data for a certain period of time. So there's going to be a conflict of law in that situation. We'll have to see how that works its way through. Another thing I saw from talking to a lot of people at the conference was there's a growth in non-immigration law firms hiring immigration attorneys because of the nature of immigration practice touching upon all these other areas, criminal, family, you know, lawsuits, personal injury, all this stuff. They want to have their own immigration attorney they're feeding it with. So if you're planning on starting your own firm or you're new or something like that or you want to branch out do something, a possibility might be communicating with one of these firms that aren't immigration and you becoming their immigration person. So you run your practice within it, but you also have a, a, a two-way street of sending your clients when they need family, you know, business, in, injury issues, all that kind of stuff, and they send you their immigrant cases when it's happening. I spoke to a lot of people that are doing that just recently started or last year, six months, last few months. Uh, so it was very interesting to see how that was happening instead of doing uh, just uh, solo practice, they're kind of merging the practice that way. Now having partners emerging is a complicated thing that I haven't done and it seems too complicated because there's too many areas where problems can happen, but if you're gonna do that, definitely study that in detail to make sure you're doing it right. Now, just a couple of ideas uh, I had when I was talking to people and things people say interesting is, one is, you know, there's a saying that's uh, based on, I think a Malcolm Gladwell book, or one of these things, freaking obvious, that said you need to study if you're going to be a professional on something, you need to spend 10,000 hours of doing it. And the 10,000 hour number has all over the place. I'm sure you heard it before. But uh, I was talking at the law student seminar and uh, it just popped in my head. Uh, to be a good immigration attorney, it's not necessarily 10,000 hours, it's 10,000 phone calls with individual people. After talking to 10,000 people, and I'm getting a, a few thousand short of hitting that, but I can see your ability to you know communicate with people see what their needs are getting down to the core of the issue and uh, be able to close the deal so if they're gonna you know go with another attorney as opposed to you uh, the ability to have talked to so many people and and learn from that experience uh, is what's going to differentiate you between a you know a skillful practitioner uh, both on the business side and on the legal side of an immigration practice so um, my thing is try if you have a phone calls uh, to your office don't have a receptionist take it don't have an intake person take it do it yourself uh, until you talk to thousands and thousands of people and then you can hand it off to someone else. That skill from talking to all these different people, um, as annoying as it could be at times, uh, was really key for my ability to, to connect with my clients. So I definitely recommend talk to as many clients as possible, um, spend that time. You learn a lot about people in general and it helps you in your life and business and everything else. Another important thing is when you're doing immigration, you know the law is the law on one side, sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's not. But at the end of the day, it's always about the story, the story you tell and how you color that story, how you present it. So always, and tell your clients this in a marriage, and if I tell them this, and your marriage is good, everything looks good on the law, but we gotta tell a story so they really get to know who you are and where you're from and how your love bloomed and how you got to where you are today. So pictures help that story, captions on pictures, letters from family and friends, and travel together to show, uh, you know, on this day we went on vacation, and then another one to show how the relationship got stronger and stronger. It's all a story to make the officer comfortable and giving you an approval and making sure they're not uncomfortable showing this to a supervisor and later saying, you know, I approved this because of the story. Now the supervisor's not gonna say, what were you thinking? You should have got this done. 
uh, it's able to make them comfortable making the approvable decision. And the last thing, a uh, little, little two things. Uh, talking about a story, so as, as immigration attorneys, our roles are twofold, I've realized. Uh, the attorney title doesn't really grasp it. It's One is being a writer, writing well and developing that story. The second is a detective to get the facts and information needed to write that story. We are all detective attorneys, whatever practice area you have. If you're doing personal injury, you need to study the, the, the facts of the event that led to the injury and go into as many details as possible. If you're doing criminal defense, you got to analyze whether the, you know, the criminal act could have happened factually or not, physically or not. Then you go into really detective style stuff. It's not something where someone comes to your office and you write something. You have to go and investigate and then write a good story for that investigation. So always remember your dual role as detective and writer whenever you're taking on a case. Uh, and finally, just something I came and I, I talked with other people. I hadn't noticed this before, uh, I, something I do, but I hadn't paid attention before just because I did it is, and I talked to other practitioners that are the same, and I realized I do this, is I don't take on any client or case where I can't speak directly with the applicant. So I speak two languages, English and Persian. If an applicant doesn't speak either English or Persian, I won't take on that case because it's too risky for me and for the client's case for me to have a translator even translating stuff and not me fully understanding that because something will get lost in the mix that could have consequences to the client. So I have to be able to speak directly with my client. That allows me to give them a full idea of what happened, what's going to happen, and be able to express myself properly and also just get information out of them so they can hear me. Because the last thing I want is someone going to an interview uh, and not having spoke to me directly and then saying the wrong thing or not fully understanding what's going on because they weren't prepared well for the, the interview and the immigration process they're going through. So it's a, it's an unwritten rule but now I mean official that I don't handle cases where I can't speak with the client directly and I think it's very important that uh, to the extent possible that all of you do the same. Uh, to the extent possible, sometimes the four, sometimes you know, there's issues where they can't do it for whatever reason, so it's not, nothing's absolute, but I, I try my best to avoid uh, a situation where I'm not uh, com directly communicating with the client. This happens a lot when brothers and sisters of clients call too. Um, they say, oh, my brother's overseas, sister's overseas, or that work, I could tell you everything. Sometimes mothers call for the children. I'm like, no, that's the applicant. Until I talk to that person, I've been burned on this before too. And take my advice, don't get burned on this yourself. Uh, speak with the person themselves. There's little nuanced things. For example, uh, I talked to a mother of a person, the case was all good, the person went to the interview, got denied. The day before the interview, I finally got a hold of the son, was a student, uh, took forever. The son was all over the place. He was just like not paying attention. But as soon as I talked to him on the phone, within five minutes, I realized this person doesn't have the the wherewithal to be able to handle an interview just because they're spacey and they don't care and they're in their own world. Uh, everything should be good, but how off the person was, I think it was a spoiled kid kind of thing, um, that caused their interview to be denied. And uh, and I knew it was gonna happen, I have talked to him, I kept trying to talk to him, kept trying to, we moved the case forward, but when I finally talked to him, I said, listen, all the facts are correct, but if you go to an interview and talk like this, you're gonna get denied, you're just saying crazy things. And it happened. And uh, the mother I spoke with got, got frustrated. I talked to her. I said, listen, that's why I kept saying, let me talk to him. Why doesn't he contact me? Why doesn't he pick up his phone? The answers he was giving me, and I repeated them. I said, these are the answers he's giving me. Of course, he had denied it. She understood. She said, oh. I'm like, listen, mom, if, if you were at the interview, I wouldn't have a problem. I'll say you get 10 visas. But the way this guy is handling it, and that's something you guys got to deal with, uh, this is not a proper way to go and handle a government interview. And so, uh, even in the English case, if I don't talk to the applicant, I'm not going to take on the case anymore because you know I got paid on it. It wasn't my fault. Everything was good, but I don't want to have denials in my hand. I don't want to have people even have an inkling of unsatisfaction with my service. Uh, from learning from that case is, you know, even if I get paid, the consultation uh, has to happen and include both or separate consultation for each before I sign a contract before I go forward because I got to know the competency level of the people I'm dealing with um, and, and how much I have to prepare them. So that was just one of those things that uh, came up when I, I spoke with a person that does removal and she speaks Spanish. She says, I only do Spanish English cases. I won't do a Chinese case, this and that, because I can't speak directly with the client and how important it is to know that. For example, she was saying when she goes to a, a removal hearing and there's a translator there, she has to pay attention to the translator because they might translate the applicant's information bad and she has to stop. Some, she says she does it all the time. Where the uh, translator says something, she says, stop, stop, stop. The translator is not doing it properly. You know, they're paraphrasing, they're changing it up. She has to listen to the applicant saying, and then the translator says, make sure it's right, while at the same time paying attention to the prosecutor, the court, the this and that. So it's a very stressful process. You gotta be very in tune and very on top of it to be able to handle a removal case like that. Luckily, she was a good practitioner. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting and speaking with her. But that's something that's very important, to develop that quality of, of legal work 
Um, the more information you have, the better. The better communication you have directly with your client, the better. So that's something I strongly recommend you adopt in your practice, even at the detriment of losing clients. Um, it's, it's very important to do to keep your standards high. Uh, that's it for today. Thank you for listening. I'll uh, have more stuff next week. I met a lot of people at the conference that I wanted to do interviews with, but between scheduling conflicts and stuff, we'll see how it goes. Also, different area laws I want to analyze, but uh, things are just going crazy. A bunch of new work just opened up uh, because of this court decision I have to deal with. And at, my, at the conference, I spoke um, at an NBC panel about tips and tricks for the NBC and stuff like that. And I mentioned, I said, listen, every day there's new stuff that's happening. When we have a flat rate for console processing, you know, you, the client paid, we started process six months ago, and now all of a sudden it hits all these walls that create hours and hours of extra work from contacting Congress people, contacting the NBC, um, not knowing what's going on with these travel bans, all this kind of stuff. We gotta be really careful about the pricing structure we do because all of a sudden we're on the hook for additional hours of work. For me right now, um, today it's opened up, I already had a bunch of stuff I had to do. It opened up like 10 hours of extra work for this week that I gotta not sleep do because of, of phone calls and follow-ups and emails and, and all this kind of stuff that was unexpected. So don't feel bad when you're quoting a, a price you think is higher necessarily a little bit to cover these extra times or you know, you could say that if there's new things that pop up, there's an extra hourly fee, but when could you consider what a new fee is, what isn't? Do clients really wanna pay a flat rate and then pay an extra hourly afterwards with the unknown amount? So don't be hesitant in quoting and preparing for this stuff, because this is gonna happen. The next four years are gonna be this. And frankly, during the President Obama administration, these kind of administrative processing issues, these kind of hiccups with the NBC, uh, in other areas you know, uh, of the USCIS delaying, lagging, having to make a request and update requests for delayed cases, these are all happening. So uh, don't, you know, bare bones it, and then get frustrated later because the amount of work that's coming in. Uh, right now I have a bunch of work that I, I didn't expect this week and I'm slammed now and that causes me to not be able to be there for my other clients. And so that's very disappointing when I have to take away from you know clients because of really nonsense uh, that pops up because of the regulations issues, delays, all that kind of stuff. So you know you gotta leave your schedule open for these kind of things and this was totally unexpected for me, uh, the travel ban situation. Uh, so we'll have to deal with that. We'll do it, everything's gonna happen fine and relationship with my clients are good, they have understanding. but I, you know, prefer to be prepared for all this. Uh, having said that, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast, episode 46. If you had any questions, comments, or anything else, please feel free to email me at info at jqklaw.com. That's info at jqklaw.com. I really enjoy speaking with you. If you listen and you enjoy this, feel free to shoot me an email and connect. Uh, every week I get a couple of people contacting me. At the conference, people would stop me and say, hey, John, you know, I listen to your podcast. It's a wonderful feeling for me. And it, it helps me continue doing this because I know there are people out there that are getting something from it. So please do. Uh, if you want information about the Immigration Lawyers listservs I've started, just email me as well. If you're an attorney, I'd be happy to add you to those. Uh, there's a couple more stuff I, I usually forget about, but I'll try to <laughs> put that in the next podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye.